So submersed aquatic vegetation is a big topic. There's a lot of information out there on it. I'm gonna uh, talk to you just about some specific um, topics within that, that big topic. And specifically, what is SAV? Um, because there is some confusion about that, where it's found, why we think it's important, a little bit of history of SAV in Chesapeake Bay, I'll touch on some of that research that Mike mentioned, um, both past and present, and then provide some, some online resources for you to follow up on later if you'd like to learn more. So the photograph here, and there are photographs kind of sprinkled through this, is one of my favorite species of SAV, redhead grass, Potomagaton perfoliatus. It used to be very abundant throughout the bay. Um, it all but disappeared for a while, but has come back in many of the tributaries. Uh, unfortunately, not so much in the chop tank where Horn Point is located, but um, keep our fingers crossed. So what is SAV? Well, there are actually legal definitions of SAV, and you don't have to read this word for word, but I've put three examples here from Maryland legislation um, describing SAV. But basically, submersed aquatic vegetation is a group of vascular plants, vascular meaning they have tissue for conducting nutrients and the products of photosynthesis from one part of the plant to another. Um, so they're the more advanced plants. They're flowering plants, um, just like the flowering plants you see in your garden or in the landscape. Um, we refer to those as angiosperms, so they reproduce by seeds. And they are in a group called monocots, um, which are the grasses, uh, which you would recognize as your lawn grass or grasses that you see in the landscape. They are, for the most part, rooted, but there are some species that are not rooted. And they live primarily underwater, but there are some species that are adapted to uh, life um, when the tide recedes and they're exposed to the air. So I have two examples here, um, sago pondweeds, Duchini pectinata, and wild celery, Valsneri americana, two of the really abundant grasses in the mid to upper portion of the Chesapeake Bay. So what is not SAV? Um, a lot of the green stuff you see growing in the bay and along the margins is not SAV, it is algae. So three examples that you might see in the mid and upper Chesapeake Bay are muskgrass, cara, um, gutweed, what used to be referred to as uh, enteromorpha intestinalis, now it's been reclassified as ulva intestinalis, and then sea lattice or ulva lactuca. Um, and the photograph of Lactuca on the, of ulva on the top here shows it underwater, and the one in the bottom shows it exposed at low tide where it's been stranded on the surface of the sediment. So algae are green photosynthesizing plants, and, and there are other um, pigments as well, um, but they are non-vascular plants. They do not have that vascular tissue for transporting things throughout the plant. They are not flowering or seed producing plants and they do not have true roots. So they are sometimes attached to the bottom to rocks or, or uh, structure uh, via holdfast, but they do not have true roots. So that's how you can distinguish between SAV and um, algae. So if you saw the trivia questions, you already know how many species of SAV there are in Chesapeake Bay. Um, roughly 15, and of course that depends on how you define the bay. Um, just within sort of the bay and its main tributaries within the tidal portion of the tributaries, roughly 15 species. Um, and some examples going from tidal freshwater on the left, uh, water stargrass, um, to the brackish portion of the bay where you would find horn pondweed and widgeon grass and then the full saline portion of the bay near the mouth in Virginia where you find eelgrass. Um, if you would go further up into the non-tidal portions of the tributaries, there are more species. And if you considered the whole bay watershed, um, you would be looking at as many species because SAV grows in lakes, ponds, rivers, ditches, um, most places where there's water. <laughs> 
So where did these flowering underwater plants come from? The traditional view of the evolution of plants was that, um, of flowering plants was that they started out about a billion years ago or more, you know, as green algae in the oceans. And then there was sort of this linear progression and about 500 million years ago, um, the green plants had evolved some resistance to desiccation and moved up onto the land out of the water and then uh, evolved into various other forms, um, each more advanced than the previous, until finally the angiosperms emerged about 150 million years ago, the, the flowering plants. And then the, the thought was that those, a subset of those flowering plants then migrated back into the water by developing um, uh, tolerance to flooding and, and to submersion. And those led to the SAV species that we are familiar with today. So that was a sort of a simplistic view. Um, but now there's a lot of genetic work and genetic analysis going on. And as with so many other organisms, uh, it turns out it's a much more complicated story than we thought it was originally. So uh, the early aquatic plants may have led to some flowering terrestrial plants, but there's some evidence that early flowering plants actually evolved in the water, not on the land. And some of those then may have led to terrestrial flowering plants, uh, and others, other lines led to the modern aquatic plants that we know as SAV. So there were multiple events, um, and the modern angiosperms may actually have developed in the water uh, originally and then transferred to the land, which is sort of the opposite of what was originally thought. And if you wanted to learn more about this, I've put a reference up there uh, about the genetic analysis that's currently being done or recently has been done on uh, submerged aquatic plants. So these plants are growing in the water. They're flowering plants. And we know that flowering plants have to be pollinated. The flowers have to be pollinated in order to produce seed, to reproduce. So how is this accomplished in the water? Um, well, on land, most plants are either pollinated by the wind. So the wind blows the pollen from the male flowers to the female flowers or by insects, which actually carry the pollen. Um, that actually applies also to the water. There are species that are wind pollinated, so their flowers emerge above the surface of the water and wind blows the pollen, um, or insects land on the flowers and transfer the pollen that way. But there are two additional means that um, terrestrial plants don't have, and that is underwater pollination which is really interesting. Those species that do that have these filamentous um, pollen grains that get carried, drift through the water, or some of them form long chains of pollen that drift through the water and hopefully land on a, a female flower. Or um, the example I've put up here of Vallisneria americana, the um, wild celery, actually pollinates at the water surface using the water surface tension, and this is called hydroanemophily. So the spiral uh, structures that you see here and in the drawing over here carry the female flower to the surface of the water, and you can see one right here. The male flowers, shown in the drawing on the left, detach from the plant, they float up, they open up on the surface of the water. They're floating on that, that surface. They're supported by that surface tension, release the pollen, and the female flowers actually form a cone of depression in the um, surface of the water that draws in that male pollen and the plant, the flower is fertilized that way. And then that coil um, sort of recoils, draws the fertilized flower back down underwater, and that's where the seeds develop. So um, there are many variations on these themes among the very uh, diverse species of SAV, and uh, just sort of a little bit of interesting trivia for you next time you go to trivia night. So where is SAV found? 
Well, the map on the left shows the global distribution of seagrasses, seagrass set of immersed aquatic vegetation that can tolerate full salinity seawater, so they grow at the edges of the oceans. And what you can see on this map is that SAV is found uh, on every continent except Antarctica. And this doesn't include all of those freshwater brackish species that would be distributed throughout the continent. So SAV has global distribution um, with the exception of Antarctica. Within Chesapeake Bay, the map on the right shows that uh, shows the distribution of SAV in pink, and this is the distribution, sort of a, um, a historical distribution that was put together for uh, developing restoration goals in 2003. And it shows that SAV occurs in all the major tributaries and well up into many of the tributaries. And this is based on, this information uh, is based on data collected by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. They do an aerial survey uh, annually over the whole Chesapeake Bay and sometimes including coastal bays, photographing the whole bay and then analyzing that photography to delineate the locations of SAV beds throughout the bay. So that's how we know how much SAV there is in the bay each year. It's based on that aerial survey. Um, and now, and this has been going on since 1984, um, they're now starting to move to um, using satellite imagery. So there'll be some overlap for a few years, I imagine. So we know what it is, we know where it is, um, but why is it important? Why do we care? Well, the primary reason Mike mentioned is the habitat value. Uh, SAV provides habitat for a large number of organisms, starting with the invertebrates. So these are organisms um, that are represented in this conceptual diagram on the right by little grass shrimp here. But there are many organisms that live in the sediment within SAV beds, and they provide food for crabs, for small fish which forage in the beds, um, and then the larger fish which um, feed on the, the uh, small consumers. And this diagram actually was made for a seagrass bed. So in Chesapeake Bay, these higher order consumers would be represented by rockfish or maybe the occasional shark. Um, and also cow nosed rays forage in here. And of course, waterfowl. So waterfowl that winter in Chesapeake Bay uh, feed on the seeds and rhizomes and roots and tubers that are produced by the variety of SAV that grows here. In fact, um, Susquehanna Flats was famous for the enormous, vast um, flocks of overwintering waterfowl that came and fed on the enormous, expansive SAV bed that existed there. Uh, and the print on the right uh, shows two, two duck hunters um, surrounded by a large raft of these wooden, hand-carved wooden decoys that have now become so collectible. And in the skies over them, you can see all of these uh, canvasback duck, canvas ducks flying around. And there was actually a commercial fishery. So the SAV on Susquehanna Flats supported a commercial, not fishery, a, a commercial market for waterfowl in the winter. And they were there to feed on, on the roots and rhizomes of the plants. So anecdotally, and, and this is an example of the, um, the, the photograph on the lower left showing the tubers from Valsinaria americana. So anecdotally, um, this is a, a, an inspiration for the bay restoration. Um, I, I, I will tell a short story here. I wouldn't be held to this, but that a very well-known politician at one time uh, who enjoyed duck hunting was hunting and there were no ducks. And he said to the god, where are the ducks? And, you know, in essence, the, the guide said, well, the, the ducks are gone because we don't have any grass. And, you know, well, why don't we have any grass? Well, we don't know why don't we don't have any grass. And so that led to, in part, the Bay Restoration. As I said, don't hold me to that story, but it sounds good. So uh, there are other valuable functions that are performed by SAV beds. Um, wave attenuation. So if you have uh, 
waterfront property and you have an expansive SAV in front of your property, you're probably pretty well aware that um, when that SAV bed reaches the surface of the water, especially, the, the waves are attenuated as they approach the shoreline. So SAV helps protect shorelines and reduce erosion. Um, they uh, slow down the water velocities of incoming waves and, and, and uh, increase sedimentation, which helps to clear the water. They take up nutrients and carbon, and they store them both in the plant tissue and in the sediment that accumulates within the, the grass bed. And very recent work that just came in, and you may have seen this in the Bay Clip Service, um, is that they have a capacity to alter the pH of the water and may help offset um, ocean acidification, which has a negative impact on shellfish organisms that um, build shells. So these are all ecosystem services, we call them, meaning they're functions of the SAV bed that have measurable economic value. Um, and it's important to note also that these uh, beds create a positive feedback loop. So by causing sedimentation, increasing the water clarity, taking up the nutrients, they allow water, uh, excuse me, sunlight to penetrate deeper into the water. And so the SAV bed can actually move out into deeper water. And we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. But that is an important concept that once you get over a certain threshold, the SAV will improve water quality enough to help promote its own growth. So just to um, illustrate, excuse me, go back here, just to illustrate the value of, of the SAV beds, I have a, a short video here. This was taken in Annapolis last year, 2019. And you can see the SAV beds and the marshes along the edge. You'll see lots of different species of SAV in here and some of the organisms that inhabit the SAV bed, the small forage fish, crabs, and um, a larger predatory fish, I think a white perch. And this video was posted on YouTube by a photographer named Jay Fleming. Um, and you can find more of his videos on there if you're, if you're interested. So moving right along. So recognizing those valuable functions, it's not surprising that SAV has legal protection. Um, for, so for Chesapeake Bay, there are laws on the books in Maryland, Virginia, and the District of Columbia, Columbia protecting SAV. Um, so there, uh, you are required to have a, a permit review for impacts on SAV if you want to do any dredging and filling, any kind of shoreline structure construction, shoreline stabilization, including living shorelines, aquaculture leases. Um, and SAV is also pr protected by the federal statutes of the Clean Water Act and Act. And the document that I'm showing on the right hand side of the screen there and the link at the left are the document summarizes the legal protections for SAV and um, is a roadmap in case you're thinking of doing anything that might impact SAV. There are some exceptions. And so um, it's a good document to look over if you would like more information on legal protections. So history in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we don't know so much from before the turn of the 20th century other than anecdotal. Um, but we do know that in the mid 1930s, the eelgrass wasting disease, which was affecting the whole east coast of the US, um, affected the zostra that, that was growing in the lower Chesapeake Bay. And in the 1940s, there were some invasions of uh, what we refer to as um, ex uh, invasive exotic species, so species that were not from uh, the Chesapeake Bay, not native of the native species of SAV. By the mid-1950s, SAV was declining throughout the Bay, and the causes were not really understood, but the decline was known. But in 1972, Hurricane, well, Tropical Storm Agnes hit the Chesapeake Bay region, and 
in not just the region, but the watershed. It moved straight up the bay and through the watershed, um, dropped a tremendous amount of rain on the watershed. So there was a huge discharge of fresh water into the Susquehanna Flats, and it decimated the SAV beds that were growing, still growing at the flats, and accelerated the losses of SAV throughout the Chesapeake, the mid and upper Chesapeake Bays. So uh, recognizing that this was going on, um, the, uh, an, a formal SAV survey was begun by the Maryland Department of Natural Resources in 1978. And in 1984, the Bay Program funded the aerial survey that's been conducted ever since by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Um, also in the 1980s, that hydrilla invasion that Mike uh, Rowan mentioned at the beginning um, turned up in a couple of places in the Bay, notably the Potomac River and the Susquehanna Flats. And there was a great deal of negative press about this and fears about hydrilla taking over the Bay, uh, all kinds of headlines. It turns out, um, you know, 20, 30 years later, we realized it probably facilitated the return of some of the native species, um, places like the Potomac River, and it supports uh, fish populations, and so it didn't turn out to be nearly the monster that we thought it would, and nor have uh, the other exotic species in retrospect. Eurasian water milfoil is a component of our uh, SAV flora now, and water chestnut occurs occasionally, but is not very common. So um, beginning in the 1980s, in 1985, the Maryland phosphate ban was instituted, and SAV began to slowly recover. Um, so the uh, green bars on the right-hand side show the numbers for, and I don't have the scale on here, but basically show what SAV was doing based on that aerial survey. Um, that there was a slow increase, but you know, so interannual variability. 2011, we had two tropical storms that hit one right after another, and that was uh, pretty hard on the SAV. And then, you know, we've had recovery since then. Here's 2019, a uh, very high flow year in the Susquehanna River Basin and um, poor water quality, and it definitely had a negative impact on the SAV. So the causes, um, initially we knew about the, the disease that affected Zostra, but it was uncertain what the causes in the mid and upper Chesapeake Bay declines um, could be. So in the early 1980s, there was the Chesapeake Bay program funded one of the first big uh, ecosystem scale studies to, to examine this problem. And there was a large SAV component of that that was conducted at Horn Point Laboratory by Mike Kemp, Robert Tully, Court Stevenson, and Walter Boynton over at, um, and Jamie's at, at Chesapeake Biological Laboratory, our sister lab on the Western Shore. And if, you're, if you've been to Horn Point, um, you've probably seen the SAV ponds. Part of the study was conducted in the field. Part of the study was conducted in these ponds. And then part of it was conducted in, you know, aquaria under artificial light. So it was sort of a big hierarchical study. And these ponds are still at Horn Point today, although um, you might not recognize a lot of the rest of the campus. But you can see the, the ponds were planted with SAV and then they were treated with nutrients because nutrients eutrophication had um, come to be thought of as probably a, a primary driver of the decline. So it resulted in this landmark paper um, that came out in 1983 identifying eutrophication as a primary cause of the, the SAV decline, at least in the mid and upper Chesapeake Bay regions. And I really like to call this a landmark study because it was the first big study that I was involved in as an undergraduate student when I came to Horn Point as a summer intern. And so I do just want to mention Horn Point has a great summer intern program um, and lots of opportunities for students. So how does eutrophication impact the SAV? Well, this schematic diagram shows that uh, the green plants need sunlight, phytoplankton and sediment intercept that sunlight but nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizers, sewage treatment plants, various sources that make their way into the bay uh, 
cause the proliferation of phytoplankton, which absorbs the sunlight, reduces the amount of light that reaches the SAV growing on the bottom, and causes the SAV then to have to grow in shallower water. In addition to that, it causes epiphytes, what we call refer to as epiphytes, and this is a community of organisms that live on the plant leaves, and they're stimulated by uh, the nutrients, and they also intercept light and reduce the amount of light that reaches the photosynthetic tissues of the plant. So the combination limits SAV to shallower and shallower water, and eventually, in many areas, the SAV was lost, causing a shift from what we call a benthic dominated ecosystem where the photosynthesis is occurring on the bottom to a pelagic system, meaning in the water columns that by plankton. And so the hope for recovery was that reducing nutrients would shift us back to a more benthic dominated system favoring SAV. So the SAV restoration program was born. This is part of the Chesapeake Bay program. Um, they developed an SAV working group and uh, defined the SAV habitat requirements. So that would be the water quality parameters that favor SAV growth. And this is a, a diagram here from a study that we conducted um, back in the 80s. Uh, and just quickly, you have particulate material on the axis here, chlorophyll A here, and KD, which is a, um, a measure of light penetration through the water column. And the open circles demonstrate uh, where there is not SAV, sites that we surveyed where there was no SAV. The crosses are the ones that show where there were persistent SAV beds. And so we use these types of graphs to determine where the water quality was favorable for SAV and to develop what we call this technical synthesis. There are a lot of people involved in this. The Bay SAV research community is a large community. It's not just Horn Point. It's not even just Horn Point and VIMS. It's a very large community and many people contributed to this work. Um, so then goals were set. Uh, there was a habitat uh, goal implementation team formed to develop a management strategy and that included the monitoring by VIMS, um, restoring water clarity by developing these total maximum daily loads, transplanting where needed, but of course we knew that from previous work that that only works where water quality requirements for SAV are met. We have a large outreach and education component and you can go to the link at the bottom here if you would like to learn more about this. This is actually a slide that was sent to me by Brooke Landry from the SAV work group showing the current efforts um, that they've undertaken for the restoration of SAV in Chesapeake Bay. And I have a link at the end um, for this so that you can go to their website and look for more. And there are opportunities there for citizen science if anyone would like to get more involved. So where are we? Well, um, the 2017 goal of 90,000 acres was met um, with over 100,000 acres of SAV. The next benchmark is in 2025. Uh, that's 130,000 acres shown by this line right here. What you can see is although we met the goal in 2017, um, the last couple years have not been so good, most likely due to the, the high rainfall that we received and the large freshwater discharges that came into the watershed, especially through the Susquehanna River. So we're getting there, but there's lots of interannual variability, most likely related to changes in water quality. There are some future challenges um, to SAV restoration. So we know that eutrophication is still a major driver and that interannual variability is a good indication of that. We're sort of like on the cusp of having water quality that's good enough for SAV, but whenever we get a, a high rainfall year with a lot of nutrients being carried into the bay by that fresh water, um, we usually see a decline in the SAV coverage. So um, that's a, a, a indication that nutrients are still limiting SAV expansion. And of course, our population in Chesapeake Bay in the watershed is still expanding. So the Census Bureau data in the upper right hand graph shows the populations for Maryland in blue and Virginia in red. 
still growing. Um, and so that makes it hard to control nitrogen uh, nutrient inputs because more people produce more nutrients and there's uh, generally um, you know, more impervious surface, and so lots of problems there. Climate change is the other uh, sort of wild card, really. We don't know exactly uh, how it's going to impact SAV, but it's pretty certain to have um, at least a couple impacts. Eelgrass, we know, is at the southernmost um, limit of its range due to temperature. It's more of a cold water plant. So as water temperatures in the Chesapeake Bay increase, eelgrass may be push, pushed further northward up the coast, and the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay may be colonized by more southern species. Um, sea level rise is gonna change the bathymetry of the bay. So if light penetration limits how deep SAV can grow and the water depth is increasing, that SAV may have to move somewhat to accommodate sea level rise. And then temperature, sea level rise, and changes in precipitation may change the salinity distribution in the bay. And so this is on salinity tolerance. Just showing um, in the graph on the right here, the sea level rise trend for the NOAA tide gauge in Annapolis, Maryland, and this graph of the global temperature anomaly in 2018, that's the difference between the temperature in 2018 compared with the average temperature in 19 from the in the period from 1951 to 1980, and you can see that the Mid-Atlantic region in Chesapeake, uh, in North America, um, it's not a, a hot spot like the the uh, polar regions are, but it is an area where we are seeing increased temperatures. So those are some challenges going forward. There are a lot of people working on this science, trying to figure out what these model, what these uh, impacts may be to SAV. Excuse me. Um, so current research, there's a lot of work going on, not just at Horn Point. I, I have highlighted some UMSI's work here. Uh, water quality, there was recent work done by Cassie Gerbitz, a graduate of the Mies program from Horn Point, who is now at St. Mary's School. Um, sediment transport, geomorphology, how does uh, SAV affect the transport of sediment within the bay? And uh, my colleague Cindy Palenkis, who I'm working with on the Living Shoreline Program, um, and her student Emily Russ have been looking at this. William Narden uh, is, has been looking at this on the coastal, in the coastal bays areas and at Susquehanna Flats. Um, so the, the names in blue here are UMSI's folks. And then there's genetic work, some really interesting genetic work going on um, by Katja Engelhardt from the Appalachian Laboratory, looking at genetic diversity of Valsinaria and the implications for restoration. So lots of work going on uh, recently. And, and I'll just highlight two projects. Uh, Cassie, whom I just mentioned, is looking at uh, the resource conflicts between oyster aquaculture and SAV. So remember I said, if you wanna get an a, a oyster aquaculture lease, you have to have an impact study done on uh, what the potential impact on SAV would be. And the same for living shorelines. So Cindy and I have this project on um, living shoreline SAV potential conflicts and, and they may not be conflicts. It may be that um, they work well together. So. But uh, these are areas of active research, and this is a report that was put out a couple of years ago on the um, interactions between aquatic vegetation and shellfish related to those aquaculture leases. So as promised, here is uh, a list of online resources and some links, and there's a free out there, um, and uh, my, Let's see, my uh, email address is here. Please feel free to email me with questions afterward. And the background photo was not taken at Susquehanna Flats. It is from Harbor Cove in Talbot County in 2015, uh, taken by Peter McGowan from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, wonderful bed out there in 2015. So anyway, with that, I'll be happy to take questions, Mike.
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. We have quite a few questions. And as I mentioned before, if you wanted to, you don't have to write these things down. You could uh, look at the, uh, the recording of this that, that Karen's going to send out to everyone. So, um, Lori, uh, there's a question. Are animals ever involved in SAV pollination? Uh, they're thinking specifically about seahorses. I am not aware of seahorses being involved in pollination, um, but dragonflies land on some spe on the flowers of some species that hold their, their inflorescence just above the water surface. And if you look at an SAV bed, when it's in flower, you can often see those dragonflies hopping from flower to flower. So here, a couple of questions about invasives. Is it better to have invasive SAV than none at all? And then also, how did hydrilla facilitate the growth of our native SAVs? So, you know, I, I would say there's no one answer to that question. I mean, uh, it, it depends an awful lot on what the invasive species is and whether it's actually invasive. Um, so the story on hydrilla was that the water quality in the Potomac River was really not very good and it was not supporting a big resurgence of SAV. And then hydrilla was was introduced and the origins of that are, are questionable, but because it was able to get established in very shallow water and because of the feedback loop where it baffled the water, it increased water clarity, allowed uh, increased light penetration, the beds actually went out into the deeper water and improved water quality. They got to the to the density and area that they could improve water quality and then other species started to come back into those areas where the water quality had been improved by the hydrillus. So there were multiple factors. I mean there are also you know major nutrient reduction efforts going on in the Potomac River but it, it essentially became part of the flora as opposed to sort of taking over everything and that took a couple of decades but it persists in the Potomac today and it's not really problematic. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question. Is low are low oxygen levels an issue for SAV decline? So um, yes and no. Um, plants produce oxygen. So during the day, it's definitely not um, not a problem because they're releasing oxygen. They're taking up CO2 and um, as a byproduct of photosynthesis, oxygen is released back into the waters. But at night in areas uh, where the SAV is dense, you can see the oxygen drop down to pretty low levels. It generally tends not to be a problem for the SAV, but it can be a problem for fish and other organisms that live in the SAV bed. So there are some diurnal movements into and out of the beds um, that may be driven in part by that oxygen um, deficit. But the, the main thing is plants are, these plants are growing in shallow areas. They're not growing in the deep portions of the bay that experience hypoxia or anoxia. Great. Okay. Here's how how is Horn Point partnering with other organizations to educate the public on the impact of fertilizers and other nutrients on SAV? Um, gosh, Mike, I almost have to turn that one over to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as I said, we Horn Point um, you know, we're a scientific organization, not an advocacy, but we have a number of partners that we work with like the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Shore Rivers, Eastern Shore Land Conservancy. Um, you know, we do lectures like this uh, and, and um, you know, we have a website that, that tells folks about our research. And, and then people like Lori serve on, and other faculty serve on state committees um, to present their results. Um, and then these results are used to make um, management decisions for the state. So those are um, some ways that we do that. Um, here's a question. What happened to the milfoil that was so common in the 1960s? Yeah, so this is a typical pattern. Um, often when a new species is introduced into an ecosystem, it, it proliferates and then over time it just sort of becomes part of the 
started out dominating that flora. And that's pretty much what happened with, with hydrilla as well as uh, the Eurasian water milfoil. It really did seem to, the milfoil seemed to dominate at first, but now it's part of the SAV community and it's not a dominant factor. And so there are a couple of things that could lead to that. You know, when a new species is introduced into an environment, um, the predators that consume it, the diseases that, that it's exposed to in its native environment don't, may not exist in the new environment. But over time, um, those other organisms may be introduced or the, the organisms that live there may adapt to that new species and be able to keep it in check. So that's not an uncommon pattern to see in a, uh, for a, a, an exotic, the invasion of an exotic species. Okay, thank you. Here's a question. Um, Dan Watson, any comment on recent news about the new water chestnut invasion in the upper Potomac? Yes. <laughs> so that was discovered by my friend Nancy Rubicki, who works for USGS. And she actually has traveled um, to China. And, and I cannot give you the specifics of what else she found, but she has identified basically a new species and um, has, I think, tracked its introduction uh, to a specific uh, park in the Potomac Basin. But I could give you her contact, I could provide her contact information, but Nancy Rubicki, uh, R-Y-B-I-C-K-I, is the person that you should contact about that, and she can give you all the information. Here's, here's a question from, from obviously a, a a boater like myself that have gone through SAV beds and had to tilt the engine up and get all the, all the SAV off the prop. Um, is it possible to have too much SAV? <laughs> well, I guess it depends on your point of view. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think about this a little bit, you know, it's probably a peak in SAV you know, my guess would be the SAV was stimulated by nutrient inputs to the bay long before anybody was really thinking about this, but probably back in John Smith's time, you know, when the bay was a lot more oligotrophic, meaning there were a lot lower levels of nutrients in the bay, the SAV population may have been um, lower as well. I, that's just speculation. But um, I guess my response would be, I don't think we're there yet. You, you know, there may be a point where there's enough SAV that you wouldn't worry so much about displacing it to put in a living shoreline or taking out a small amount for boat navigation or something like that. Um, but I don't think I don't think we're quite there yet in terms of the habitat value of, of the SAV beds. So I, I saw that there was a report by a, a uh, a company in the lower bay that was starting to do aquaculture for S SAV. And, and do you think this has potential to, you know, essentially grow certain kinds of plants for pharmacological food products? And then of course the plants are taking nutrients out of the bay. So it's kind of a win-win like with oyster aquaculture. Yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, I don't know if there, I, I didn't see that particular report, but I mean, if it's for restoration, I think it's great, um, but you just always have to keep in mind it's the transplanting SAV doesn't work very well unless the water quality requirements are met. Um, mm -hmm. So, but if for pharmacological reasons, I, you know, if there's potential there, that's great. I, I, I don't, I'm not aware of that uh, work. 